Hey everybody, welcome back to Weekend Watch Repair. My name is Adam. On the bench today is a really cool Seiko Bell Matic from November of 1973. I got this watch from a friend of mine I met at a local watch collectors club, and I picked it up in a dark room, which I do not advise. <laughs> and you'll see why later on, because we're gonna open this thing up. It's a real gem in disguise. And by gem, I mean rusty and broken and filthy gym, but a gym nonetheless. So I'm doing some initial inspections here and you could so you saw the date change happen just way off of midnight, but the quick set works good. Uh, obviously, as you can see there, the seconds hand is not attached, but the alarm ring seems to rotate around. Okay. The only reason I got this watch, I've wanted a Belmatic for a while and I've actually got two of them in my project drawer, but this one here I wanted to do first and the entire reason I got it was because of that dial. And I actually picked this up before the John player special, but the color scheme was so similar. I just had to have this watch. And this one is going to turn out to be probably the most filthy one I've worked on in a really long time. It's got dirt and rust and all kinds of nonsense in it. Broken parts. We can see when we take the case back off here that the gasket is missing and take a look inside there. You can see all that rust and cor corrosion and just in the case around there where the threads are for the case back, you can see all that metal pitted out. This is not good at all. And we're going to dig into this watch and someone had clearly been in here and did just, I think they just decided this project wasn't for them. And so we find broken parts, parts installed incorrectly, uh, you know, the obvious dirt and the grime and all everything else. So this in here is going to turn out to be a real big project. But we're going to get into this here, starting by removing the oscillating weight. Next up, we can remove the automatic works. And we need to get this off before we can take out any potential wind in the watch. And you probably already noticed that I did not have an initial time graph for reading. I could not get this watch to fire up. Uh, you'll see why later. And I mean, obviously, my initial thought was, yeah, well, it's filthy and there's rust and grime and everything in, in, in it. And it's probably just too dirty to run, but uh, I mean, this wheel train is locked up pretty bad and we'll see why here in a bit. So we're gonna get, we get these three screws off and now we can go ahead and just start to remove this thing and kind of work this plate off here a little bit. It actually comes off okay. If you're a regular viewer of my channel, uh, again, I haven't been doing this very long. I don't have very many videos up yet. But if you're a regular viewer of the channel, you'll notice in this video here, I spent a little bit of time kind of re-adjusting the lighting setup and some camera settings. And so I've edited this video in a different way. I really hope you like it. It sure did take me a lot longer to get this one done. But as we remove these, these crowns and stems, what I want to show you here is take a look inside the case there, right where that those stems go in and take a look at all that rust that's inside those recesses. Where, the, where those crown tubes go. I mean, that's unreal. I mean, it, it's just, this this thing here is in pretty bad shape. But nevertheless, we're gonna see what we can do and see if we can get it going. With those out of the way, we can go ahead and get this watch out of the case. The Seiko Belmatics, you notice there was no movement ring that was in there. There's actually a re, kind of a retaining spring that this watch was missing. So I'm gonna have to source one of those. So there's part one. Once we get that off, we can go ahead and take a look here. There is this clamp here that you see with the arrow. That is a one of two clamps that are supposed to hold on that alarm setting wheel. And that one there has two problems. One is that it's installed in the incorrect orientation. And the second one is, is it's broken. There's a piece broken off of, of it. And actually both clamps for this are both broken. We'll have a kind of a close up view later on of those, but I had to find some of those as well. So now we're going to go ahead and get these hands aligned up. We'll just set them here to the nine o'clock position. And we can just use some plastic here to protect the dial because that's really the only thing on here worth saving. These hands, they're in rough shape, really, really rough shape. My initial thought was, well, there's missing loom on the hour hand and both the hour hand and the minute hand are both real scratched up. Maybe I can clean those up some, but uh, yeah, that one was a challenge. We'll, we'll kind of get into that here in a bit. So 
next up, we need to remove this alarm setting wheel. And th these two clamps here, this is all one shot. And I'm not even going to pretend that this was easy, kind of holding this still and under the camera. Uh, it was certainly not. But there should be a finger. You'll see an arrow pop up right here. There should be a finger that kind of sticks up on your screen that rides in that little groove on that alarm setting wheel that kind of holds that down in place. And both of those clips those were missing those fingers. So that clip isn't really holding down anything. It's just there. So that's definitely a problem. But once those are out of the way, we can go ahead and remove this alarm setting wheel. And on the underside of that, there is just a bunch of teeth right there. And that actually looks to be in pretty decent shape. And those teeth right along an intermediate alarm setting wheel that's on, on the dial side of the movement under, underneath the dial. The edge of that wheel just kind of sticks out past the dial a little bit. So next up, we need to remove the dial. So I'm going to remove the two dial feet screws. And normally on a regular watch, I just loosen these just enough to, so you can pull the dial off. But I'm going to, I want to try to kind of, you know, there's a lot of rust in here. So I'm just pulling off every screw completely. And we're going to go through and clean all these up. But with those out of the way, we just gently work the dial off here. And that there's the whole reason I got this watch is because I fell in love with that dial. I just think the color is spectacular. Really close up, there's a few tiny little marks on it, but it looks phenomenal. And that's the whole reason I wanted this watch. Everything else can be rebuilt and fixed and parts sourced. And I, I didn't know how big of a project this was actually gonna be when, we, when I first started. Uh, and you'll see through the course of this video, it is one big project. But I think that dial makes it worth it. I, uh, I probably would have used this watch as a parts watch for something else had it not had that great dial. So we're gonna begin here disassembling the dial side of the movement. We get that day wheel off. And next up here is this cover plate, which is held on by three screws. And this cover plate works the same way as a lot of the other Seiko movements where it, it, it has a, you know, just the, the same, serves the same function, holds down the date wheel and everything else. There's also a wheel permanently attached to this on the underside of it also that acts as an intermediate wheel um, to, for the uh, alarm setting. You'll kind of see the profile of that wheel as we flip this plate over here. Right there. There we go. I kind of wanted to show you the profile of that. And one thing I didn't notice when I was pulling that wheel apart right here, I thought, well, I'm missing my date jumper and date jumper spring. It's not there. That was my first thought because it was clearly gone when I pulled that wheel off, but it actually was there. When I pulled that plate off, that center that center spring that you see there in the middle, that's the friction spring for the unlocking wheel that puts pressure up on that wheel. And as I was unscrewing the plate and the plate raised up, those parts popped loose and they actually shot out the side of the movement, uh, at about six inches on my desk. They weren't difficult to find, but very easy to misplace. So we can pull this assembly off here. This is three pieces all together. That is the friction spring for the unlocking wheel right there. Then next here, this is the unlocking wheel itself. There we go. And then the hour wheel below that. And I'll kind of explain later kind of how those interact with that alarm function. But actually this here was my very first alarm watch. So, you know, I, I, I thought, well, you know, I'll go ahead and make a video out of my very first one. So <laughs> probably not the smartest thing I've ever done, but I, I, I studied this thing here pretty good. So disassembling the calendar works. I noticed here on that driving wheel, that post that you see there looks bent. We'll put an arrow up, up here and it looks like it's bent to the left a little bit, which uh, from your perspective, that wheel rotates counterclockwise. So it just probably over time, it's kind of pushed that post to the side. So we'll have to repair that part, see if it's repairable. But after that's done, we can go ahead and remove the calendar plate. The calendar plate's held on by three screws. And this one you see me pulling off right here is not one of those three. Again, first time I've ever worked on this particular movement. And now that I know what I'm looking at, I, you can tell that, I mean, that that plate is not contacting that screw at all. That screw is for the day jumper spring underneath the plate. So that mistake was on my part. It's not a big mistake at all. It's not gonna hurt anything, but I learned that after the fact and during disassembly that uh, that screw there does not need to come off in order to remove that plate. So we get these three off here. And as 
I'm pulling this up. This, all these filthy parts that are underneath it, a lot of it sticks to the plate and everything else. And a lot of stuff moved around. And so when I saw that happen, I said, you know what? I'm going to take a look at the diagram real quick. I want to see how all this kind of works together. And so I use this opportunity. I'm just going to kind of speed up the footage here. I'm putting everything back in place and checking the manual to see how it all works together. And once I had it all back where it should be, aside from that one spring there that popped out, but I'm not going to bother putting it back in. I kind of paused it right there and I, I did my homework and I studied how all these parts interact with one another and kind of moved things around and got a, an idea of how this watch works. And so uh, that helped me immensely during the rest of disassembly, how I organized my parts and then for reassembly, especially as well, it, it made the process a lot easier. I spent about 20 minutes just kind of studying everything. So that there was the alarm wheel that we just pulled out. This here is the hammer. And I noticed that hammer didn't want to pull out. So I went ahead and adjusted my crown to move it into a different position to get the tension off that alarm yoke. And then that hammer can just kind of pop off there. It's got one pivot on the underside of that, but you can see that weight attached to it. That is the date jumper. So I'm pulling that date jumper spring out of the way. And I'm going to try to lift this thing up here. It's kind of hard to, I'm finding this kind of a, you know, a coat of dirt and gunk all over all these parts that make it kind of difficult to <laughs> grab on sometimes. So you, you'll see that, especially during disassembly where I, I kind of fumble with a lot of this stuff. I found a little washer right there. We'll make sure to get that put back in. And now this date jumper spring it pinged off on me, but there we go. Definitely not difficult to find that part. This here is the intermediate unlocking wheel. And I'm just checking the teeth on that to see if they're cut on a rate with a radius or if it's directional or not. Next up here, I'm using some Rodico to, this is a very thin spring for the setting wheel lever. I, I'm just kind of using that Rodico to try to safely remove it because I definitely don't want to ping this spring off. I, you know, lately with my luck, that would be what would happen. So I'm trying to my best to avoid, you know, you know, having to source any more parts than I'm already going to have to on this watch. We'll go ahead and remove the minute wheel right here. Oddly enough, the manual on that calls that the intermediate minute wheel, but that this is a regular minute wheel. This is the disconnector spring. We'll kind of explain the interaction with all those parts here in a bit. This is the setting wheel lever complete. And there's a gear permanently affixed to the underside of this. And then there's a post and a, a, a gear underneath it as well that comes off. It's kind of a, a whole thing. There's a couple parts here. You can see that that gear there does not get removed. It, it all stays together. And the sleeve inside of that does come out. And I, I take it out off camera, but I uh, won't bother with it here. And then the intermediate minute wheel, even though the manual calls that the minute wheel, but I'm going to call it an intermediate wheel. This spring here is called the alarm bolt yoke spring. And normally, uh, I think you're, you know, you're supposed to remove that screw there before you remove the spring. I, I, it comes out easily enough without it. So I just kind of left it alone. Then we can go ahead and pop this screw off. That's holding the alarm bolt yoke itself. That's the piece that engages between the keyless works for the alarm button and the hammer to, uh, as, as far as setting the alarm and uh, enabling that thing to move. So we'll get that out of the way. And next up is the setting lever spring. And I noticed the screws, the two screws holding this down have different size heads. So I wanted to point that out on video. It's something I'm always looking for on these. And especially with this being my very first, not just, you know, Seiko 4006, alarm movement, but my first alarm movement ever, I'm really looking for this stuff. I'm taking nothing for granted as far as any previous experience working on these Seikos, but we're loosening the screws up a little bit. And then on this here, there's two springs on there and I'm, you know, getting both of those, getting the tension off of both of those before I finish loosening these screws, but we'll go ahead and pop these off here. One and go ahead and get this popped off. Take your time, Adam. This isn't awkward at all. 
now we can pull the oak spring out. And I'm going to use the same kind of Rotico technique and just, I, I just smash it in there, just smother it with Rotico. And that, that piece of Rotico is going to be pretty darn filthy by the time we get through disassembling this watch. On, on a lot of times too, what I like to do is, uh, you know, I, I always try to use clean Rotico, right? When I'm assembling a watch, but during disassembly, it gets dirty quick. There's kind of no point. So, you know, I'm, as, as long as it's still tacky enough, I have my Rotico from the previous watch. A lot of times I'll use that for these kind of tasks until it just becomes unusable. But with that spring out of the way, we can pull the yoke off here. And now we're down to just some pretty basic keyless works. This is the alarm setting lever spring. That's just going to hold down tension on that setting lever, which is what holds the alarm stem in place. But that's just one screw. It pops off easily enough. There we go. And then basically after that, it's just the alarm setting lever itself, the setting lever for the regular, the regular stem, the winding pinion and the sliding clutch, and then the cannon pinion. And then that's basically the dial side. The, you know, it's, it's less intimidating. Oh, and, the, and the setting lever post. There we go. And it's basically, you know, it's less intimidating kind of, you know, the first time you ever work on a movement, but you're really studying it. At least I do. I almost, you know, worry about it, trying to make sure I study it well enough to not get too out of whack when I, when I reassemble it. But, uh, you know, it, I find that once I really get into it and the same thing happened with, you know, my very first chronograph, which oddly enough was a Seiko, but, you know, I studied, thankfully there's good manuals on these, on these movements. And, you know, there's no shortage of places or websites or forums with people with the knowledge that are willing to share it. And I've definitely used that to my advantage at times. So it, it, it definitely helps out, especially if you're, if you're learning, if you're going to do a unique complication, um, you know, do it on a more popular movement. Like, uh, you know, if you're doing chronographs too, there's, there's no shortage of information on like the value 7750s or the 77 series stuff. Um, those are good ones to, to learn on, uh, kind of once you get to the point where you, you want to start tackling those additional complications, it, it definitely was for me. So you can see, I'm going to pull this balance off here and you saw it did, did not want to, you know, spin it. it. At first I thought it, maybe it was overbanked, but it's just when that balance, when that impulse jewel would get into the pallet fork, it would turn over, but very, very, very difficult. That wheel train is very locked up. We're just viewing this under a microscope just to check out the, in this, the spring on the, which looks pretty good on the roller table. That impulse jewel looks straight. It doesn't look bent or crooked. It's not loose. So aside from being extremely dirty, that balance was in very, you know, serviceable condition. So that's definitely a positive on this watch. So we're going to begin here by removing the ratchet wheel. This ratchet wheel screw has a, a washer just underneath it. And take a look at that washer as I pull it to the side. You can see all that gunk. I'm not faking this, folks. This is the this is the condition this watch was in. And, uh, you know, as much hair, hairs and everything else in here, like a barber shop floor, there's little hairs all over the place in this watch. But I had a difficult time pulling this ratchet wheel off. And you'll see here, I, I, I didn't cut the video. Uh, it did not want to pop off. So I first started kind of rocking a little bit. And I thought maybe the... The click spring was kind of holding it down, but, uh, you know, it's, it's just filthy. It's just been on there for ever. And in this case is, I don't know if it was left out, you know, for a week outside with no gaskets in it or something. Cause I mean, it's almost what it looks like, but, uh, we'd finally got that thing to pop off there. Now we're going to go ahead and pull this off. This is the intermediate wheel rocker for the alarm system. It, um, you know, it's the name makes it sound more complicated than it really is. The ratchet wheel for the alarm spring is a versatile screw. So we'll go ahead and get that popped off and get that wheel out of the way. And you got to remove that wheel first before you can remove that rocker arm. Uh, I guess you don't technically have to, you can kind of finagle that part out, but it makes it a lot easier to pull, to remove but if you get that alarm ratchet wheel off first, there we go. Just kind of taking a look at this. I guess I shouldn't be surprised at this point about the condition of these things, but I'm going to go ahead and check in shake. 
we'll first take a look at this alarm uh, arbor here. And you know, you know what? That is not that bad, surprisingly. So we'll go ahead and check the mainspring barrel as well. And there's a tiny bit more movement in there. And I'm going to kind of adjust my tweezer position here a little bit. I mean, we're super zoomed in. But you know what? Take a look here. We'll move it one more time. But you know what, ladies and gentlemen, there's that's kind of right on the edge. You know, in, in my opinion, that's that's on the border of, you know, if your my neuroses or you know my OCD gets the better of me, you know, I could uh, we could fix that. But I mean, that's still, you know, that's still okay. So I I decided at first here I'm going to not bother with, uh, you know, doing any repair work on there, especially with that alarm arbor. I mean, that thing was great. You know, the bushing was still perfectly fine. So uh, we're going to go ahead and make this, you know, reinstall this without doing any repair work on this bridge and on those bushings and just see what we get. So we removed the three screws holding the bridge down. And there's one screw here. I want to go ahead and get this click out of the way. And I unsuccessfully try to just pull that screw off here. So I'm just going to take the whole thing with the screw with it and get that out of the way. Now we go ahead and pull this bridge off and we'll see what we're working with here. That is pretty filthy. Now there's a lot of, a lot of gunk in there, but uh, you know, nothing too terrible. This was a surprise. So I went to remove this fourth wheel. And it was locked in there hard. I mean, it was stuck right there. Did not want to pull up. Finally got it to come up. And at first, you can see that arrow. I don't know what that was. That's not from the wheel. I think that was from somebody who'd previously worked in there. There's, I never could find a part that was missing, whatever that is. But we'll go ahead and pick this up here and take a, a closer look at it and kind of see, so you can kind of see what this was. So that thing was sitting right on the pinion of that fourth wheel. And could easily, I mean, that's way more than you need to stop a watch. And then take a look at the, at the bearing surfaces uh, on this staff on that. You can see that rust in two different spots on that fourth wheel. Uh, that's, that is not good. And I'm guessing the inside of the uh, center wheel is probably no better. The pinion on that third wheel has got all kinds of rust in it. So that's no good. We're going to go ahead and get this barrel pulled up and out of the way. And that barrel is just in horrendously filthy condition. Now we can go ahead and at least get the pallet fork bridge off here. This is held on by two screws. So what I wanted to do in this video, especially with this being the first one of this movement that I've put on YouTube, much less, you know, done myself. Uh, I wanted to make sure I try to do every single screw, every single spring, every, everything on here. With uh, these additional kind of close-up shots that I'm doing, which I, th I think, um, you know, I, I, I hope make the, the video more enjoyable. I also think that if it you're going to use this video as kind of a, a guide on, while doing your own, uh, is at least as far as how the movement is, you know, you can take it apart and put it together. Uh, I definitely think that it, it was a worthwhile to, to kind of get this detailed with it. So I'm going to show you every single screw, every single spring, every single, everything. We won't skip anything. And uh, that is my goal. So with that out of the way, this is the Arbor for the alarm wheel. And you can see that hook on the Arbor was not in that little spring where I had that arrow. Uh, couldn't get the alarm function to work on this watch either before we tore it down, which is why you didn't see it. But I'm going to rotate this Arbor around. And now you can see that's the hook on that Arbor right there. And that is what should go in that little eye at the, you know, at the center of the spring right below that arbor. Those two should, uh, should have been kind of connected together and they were not. So now we need to remove this alarm spring and it's not very difficult. The one thing you want to make sure you do when you're pulling these off is keep your center wheel bridge in place. Cause that center wheel bridge acts as part of the barrel wall for that. So it, it, it you know, it, you can remove it and keep that spring in place, but it's a lot easier for that spring to kind of pop out if it's not. So I go ahead and kept it in there while I did this, but this removes just like any other mainspring out of a barrel. You know, you get the center part out and you slowly start to work it around and try not to kink the spring. But there we go. We finally got it all taken apart. 
And as much as I talked about being thorough, there is one thing I did not show. And as I'm removing the center wheel screws and the bridge and all that, at the bottom of that mainspring uh, barrel in the main plate there, that 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 is a big washer at the in the bottom of that that does remove and I did remove it at the end. I didn't even realize it at first when I was taking the support because I'd never been in one of these before. But I noticed it during pre-cleaning. That washer does come out, and I removed it during pre-cleaning. So you, that's the one thing you don't see here. Uh, but that washer does come off, and apparently reading that is a kind of a common thing where some people forget to put those back in. Yeah. I don't know if you can really see the, the pinion on that center wheel that is in horrible shape, but you know, it is what it is. We knew what we were getting into with this movement. This big part that I'm taking off here is called the sounding spring. And this is what the hammer hits up against to create that, you know, that specific tone that you hear when the alarm goes off. So it just hits that spring and that spring vibrates and that's what gives you your, you know, alarm sound. That's held on by one screw. And we'll go ahead and just pop this thing off here. There we go. The last thing here is this is the alarm, um, just unlocking button, unlocking pusher. Uh, this is what you press down on in order to remove tension off of the alarm setting lever in order to remove the stem. So, and I'm, few unsuccessful attempts with some Rodico, but I finally just smashed it on there hard enough. Got enough of it on there and that thing pops off. Now we can go ahead and remove the mainspring and take a look at this thing when I get it open here. I pop the cap off and then I like to slide my tweezers in between the screw and the lid just to kind of hold the screw down. But I'm being very careful here and this is a really good example of it. Um, you want to make sure that wheel doesn't get bent or anything. You don't pull it off at an angle. As, as I'm starting to open it up, I notice one side of that, you, you can see it's still down. I don't want to pry that lid off, otherwise it'll bend. So I'm just very gently working it around until that thing pops off. And then the arbor stayed with it. Normally it stays on the spring, but this thing's so filthy it stayed with the lid. But that is pretty darn disgusting. That That's pretty bad. And I know the Seiko S4 grease, which is, uh, I'm either assuming that's what that is, or maybe it's that black uh, Kluber grease. I don't have any of that, but either way, um, you know, it's maybe it makes it look a little bit worse than it is, but uh, that looked pretty bad. And inspecting both the alarm spring here that's on the bottom of your screen and the regular mainspring at the top of your screen, um, the mainspring is a little bit out of flat. As you can see here, it's not terrible. But I think, uh, you know, we can, I can salvage that. That's, that's not difficult to, re to repair. So uh, I prefer to keep the original mainspring in this thing. Uh, these th springs and the bridles on these are a little bit thicker than the aftermarket spring. So if I can reuse an original one, I will. Next thing is to go ahead and get the crystal. Ugh. Well, it wasn't difficult to get the crystal out, <laughs> but it's supposed to be harder than that. Uh, this thing should have a tension ring inside the inner lip of that crystal, and it did not. So that thing can go. We're going to put a new crystal in it with a new tension ring in it anyway, so no big deal. But I guess we shouldn't be surprised at this point. So go ahead and use a case knife, and we'll go ahead and get this bezel removed. There we go. When we take a look at this, there's some rust, as you would expect in here, um, you know, and a lot of dirt. And it's kind of difficult right now at this stage of the process to see what is rust and what is dirt. But there's definitely a lot of both in here. So this is that day and date driving wheel. And you, as you can see, that post is most certainly bent. So what we do is I take it over to my trusty old staking set that is about three times as old as I am. And I find the appropriate punch and I just gently kind of press it on there and straighten that post out. And then that thing is good as new. And after that, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to go grab a, some tea or coffee or something like that, we're going to go ahead and get these parts cleaned up, uh, which is going to be a chore. So we're going to take a little intermission and I'll see you in a moment. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> 
I hope you enjoyed that. I had fun putting that together. So everything has been through the wash a few times and scrubbed and inspected and washed again and just a million different things trying to get all these parts clean. But we're down to the point where I'm just going to do a little bit of um, cleaning and lubrication of the jewels. Normally I clean these, uh, you know, outside of the standard parts cleaning, but I went ahead and pulled the jewels and cap settings and all that out and ran those through the wash as well, just to kind of clean everything together. And then I went through my process again of cleaning these, inspecting them again, and then oiling. So starting off here with the top jewel on the balanced assembly, and we'll go ahead and get this in. And as you see me put together the bottom shock setting for the balance wheel as well, I, uh, I want to kind of make note here, uh, for something on the channel that we recently hit a milestone and I'm really humbled and really happy to say that we recently surpassed 1000 subscribers. Um, you know, I'm even as I'm doing this force work, I'm kind of at a loss for words. Um, that's a really big deal. Uh, and you know, I'm, again, I'm, I'm not in this to make money right? That was never a goal. And it isn't, I mean, if we, you know, speaking frankly, like I think the channels, you know, it's like $7 or $8. Like the, 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 this channel is not some giant YouTube channel that where I'm going to make a living doing YouTube videos. Um, that's not the plan, the goal, the, you know, I'm not aspiring to do that. This is, was, and is remaining a hobby. So it wasn't about being able to monetize the channel. It's, but it is a significant milestone. It's a big round number. And, um, something that I didn't think this channel really would ever do when we first created it. So thank you to everybody. Uh, it really means a lot to me. Um, on that point, if you do enjoy this content, if you want to like, and subscribe, leave a comment, maybe, uh, you know, that would help promote the videos lately. It seems like, um, oddly enough, as soon as we hit 1000 subscribers, the, the number of views kind of, went down by half. I, I, I don't pretend to know anything about how YouTube, you know, what, how it chooses, what videos to show people. I, I found it odd that it was pretty consistent growth. And as soon as it hit a thousand subscribers, it went down, but I mean, I don't care. That's not what this is about. So, uh, if you want to like and subscribe, please do so. It would mean a lot if you enjoy it. Um, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who's, who's joined up so far. Here you saw me finish the bounce assembly, uh, jewel cleaning. And then you didn't see me put in the mainspring because I went to put it in my winder and I did not like how it was kind of fitting on the, the winder arbor. So I went ahead and put this mainspring in by hand. Um, something I did for a really long time before I ever bought a set of winders, something I'm actually pretty comfortable doing. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I took my lumps quite a long time ago, but I kind of have my own technique on how to, how I do that, but it basically is impossible to film because there's no way to get a camera in there. My hands are covering everything. So I just kind of cut to showing the mainspring installed, but I did put this one in by hand. Just again, I didn't like how that was really going uh, with the mainspring winders and you know, they're, they're not made to fit everything. So, and it made it, I probably could have gotten it in, but I just didn't, I didn't like the feeling of it when I was doing it. So I just put this one in manually. So now we're going to go ahead and put the center wheel in and uh, get some lubrication on the top side of that gear. It's a pretty good view of the microscope. It hasn't making a whole lot of uh, appearances in this video, but there's one of them. And you can see a pretty good shot there of capillary action, pulling that lubrication around. And we'll go ahead and get this center wheel bridge in. And you can see that notch on the back side of that bridge. That little notch is where the, the uh, bridle for the alarm spring is going to sit right in that little notch. And that's where it grabs it. So when you're winding the alarm spring, um, that when it reaches a full wind, that's where it's grabbing against. So there's that little base plate, little washer looking thing that I mentioned earlier. And I'm just uh, putting some 8200 down here on that plate. And that alarm spring will kind of pick that up and it'll work it around a little bit as that spring gets uh, wound and unwound. This here is also a mainspring winder that this is, this is 85 or 90 years old. Part of a, uh, a tool lot that I bought off a family of a master watchmaker, but, uh, that drum in that fit, that hole 
perfectly better than any of my new expensive shiny tools. That old part worked great. So uh, I got to use that old mainspring winder, which is pretty cool. So I'm just putting a little bit more lubrication on there and you can see that arrow. That's where that mainspring kind of sits in against that center wheel bridge. That's a really good shot there of it. So once we get some uh, lubrication on here, now I can go ahead and put that arbor in and there we go. This one here really was, wasn't too bad. I'm, I'm kind of not terribly pleased. I'd like to see the, you know, the inner coil of that spring be a little bit tighter, but you know, once I kind of ratcheted it around and kind of got it in place, it kind of seated in pretty tight against that arbor. Now we can go ahead and put our mainspring in. And one thing, uh, there's one other thing I did not show on here. And that was, uh, I put a little drop of oil on the uh, top of that arbor. I'm going to lubricate the bottom side of it from the back side of the main plate, but uh, I did pre-lubricate the top of that. So um, as far as memory goes, I think that's the only thing I, I forgot to, I forgot out of the edit. So um, outside of that, I know we didn't show the disassembly of the automatic works, but uh, you'll, you'll see the full assembly of that here. So I just figured it, I mean, it kind of pointless to show it twice so soon one after the other. So I just figured I'd just put the, assembly in there and you can see all the opponents go together. But here we're going to go ahead and we got the escape wheel in and we're getting that third wheel in. And I was able to get all the rust off of this thing and it looked pretty good. And the harder part was cleaning that, uh, the inside of that center wheel that took a bit of time. And I was using some smoothing brooches in order to get in there and do that. But, um, looking at that through the microscope, it, it, it all cleaned up and, uh, there's no rust in there anymore. Everything looks smooth and nice. So we're going to give these a go and uh, see if we can get this thing to run. So we got the plate on here and we're going to go ahead and give us, you know, give this thing our little tapping trip and trick and cross our fingers and hope that it works. And <laughs> It did. So now we can go ahead and get our screws in. And that's a, that's a new holder. I got that little, that holder there. I'm not sure what the name of that, material is, but you know, it's a non marring material. Uh, thank you to my patrons. Uh, that's exactly what I, I use your donations to purchase that. Um, again, every, everything that comes in through Patreon through my patrons is, uh, goes directly to the channel. I don't keep any of it. Um, so it's either going to go to uh, tools or, you know, watches or stuff like that. So if you'd like to take a look at us over on Patreon, I really would appreciate it. I, now that we've reached a thousand subscribers, what I'm able to do now is create videos that uh, don't display ads. So I'm going to put ad free videos of everything I upload over there. So you can kind of watch those without interruption. There is some really cool stickers and thank you packets that I send out to everyone. And I sure appreciate you coming along and uh, supporting the channel. If you'd like to take a look at it, the link is on your screen and um, thanks again, everybody. I really appreciate it. I'm not really much of a, a salesman. I don't know how to do sales pitches and that's not what it's about, but uh, just, I genuinely appreciate the folks who go over there and uh, who support the channel, it means a lot. And it, it does help out tremendously. Oh, and one other thing, uh, I'd like to do a personal shout out and thank you to my patron, Matt. Um, I was talking with him about this build as I was kind of working through it. And uh, he asked me if I had a manual for it. I said, yeah, I've downloaded one. And uh, I, I've got the manual off uh, of um, the My Retro Watches website of, uh, I like Mike's channel. I've never met Mike. Uh, he doesn't know me from Adam, uh, no pun intended, but, um, you know, I like his channel and his website has a fantastic library of documentation where it looks like he's consolidated a bunch of stuff. You're able to find it a bunch of other places and kind of put it in one spot. So, um, you know, this, I get nothing out of it. He doesn't even know I'm doing it, but, uh, I, I, I referenced that library quite a bit on his website. So, uh, but I had downloaded the document and I was telling him, I said, yeah, I've got one. I've got a manual for it. And he's like, he says, are, are you a member of uh, AWCI? Which I'm not, I've looked into it, but I hadn't done it yet. And he said, man, they've got some really good manuals on there. So, uh, the manual I had was not color, uh, as pretty much all of them I had found on the internet were the same copy of the manual as a black and white copy. And, uh, he checked and he had this gorgeous, looked like a brand new document, color manual, much clearer, easier to read. And, uh, you know, he, he's kind of convinced me I, at some point real soon, I'm going to 
sign up myself for that resource. I mean, it's, I went and really read into it. It's phenomenal, but, um, thank you, Matt. I mean, that manual was, uh, really cool, really, really handy to have, you know, I put it on my computer, I was able to zoom in, uh, really, especially with the, the date driving wheel, uh, finger that's on it, it can be installed multiple different ways. And I wanted to see what the correct way was. Uh, cause I had, uh, pulled it out so quickly on the video. I didn't even pay attention, but, uh, you could put that on in one of two ways. And if you put it on the wrong way, I mean, your date, it'll still change the day and date over, but there, there will be like a six hour break between when the date goes and when the day goes. So, uh, I used that manual. I was able to zoom in super close cause it was a good quality document and I saw the right way to do it. And so I got it nailed down the first time. So thank you, Matt. <laughs> patron to the rescue. I love it. So, uh, yeah, enough of that. Well, we'll, uh, we'll get back to the video here. Got the wheel train installed and lubricated top and bottom. And now I'm lubricating the escapement and I'm putting some 9415 on the exit stone of this pallet jewel of this pallet fork, and then applying that to five teeth at a time. This movement here has 15 teeth on the escape wheel. So we're going to do this process three times and then just, you can kind of see it rotated here. And at the, after the third time, I just kind of wind the wheel a little bit more around and just kind of work that around, but just making sure that it's, you know, in there good. And as soon as that balance goes in and fires up, it'll spread that around too. And it'll even out a little bit, but, uh, that's how I do it. Kind of difficult to film. Hopefully you kind of got the idea for it. And now we go ahead and install this balance and I got it in here and it, it the wheel was just a a little bit off. So there we go. A little quick adjustment. And now I'm going to go ahead and just gently press this thing down. And you can see it's kind of moving a little bit there, but that balance is starting to speed up and you really can't gauge how healthy that thing is at first glance until you get that screw down and get that balance into its final resting position. But, uh, that, that balance wheel is really starting to fire up and look pretty good. You know, at first glance, you know, that, that, I mean, you know, you can't really gauge amplitude like that unless you, you can film it with your phone and then view it in slow motion or something and kind of give an idea. But I mean, at first glance, that looks pretty darn good. So next up, we can get this sounding spring put back in. So this indexes on two posts on the main plate. So I kind of get those two posts lined up and then I'll just press it down here and we can go ahead and get this screw put in. So at this point here, I stopped the build and uh, made sure the watch had a full wind in it. And I did a, you know, a quick regulation, took about 10 minutes or so, and then let it run for 24 hours. So what you're seeing here is it's timekeeping and amplitude after that initial 24 hours without any additional wind being put in. So we have pretty steady timekeeping. This is all in the dial down position in this video here. Uh, within a few seconds, amplitude is in, you know, high two sixties to mid low to mid two seventies, which is great. Um, really happy that, you know, the mainspring seems to be, you know, functioning as it should. I, I'm liking the numbers. The dial up positions were very similar and I'll go ahead and do the, really the uh, fine tuning of that. Once I get the rest of this movement put together. And once I get it into the case, um, you know, I, residents, I think, you know, does have an effect on some of these. You'll see numbers change especially once you case the movement. So uh, I always do kind of like the final tweaking of tiny little things after it's been running for multiple days and it's back in its case and uh, you know, everything's good to go, but those are great numbers. Super happy with it. Um, I think that all the extra work that was put into the cleaning process, because this was easily far and away at least double the amount of time I've ever had to spend cleaning a movement. Um, on any watch I've ever even, I've even, I mean, I've done some pretty bad ones too and some old pocket watches, but I really took a lot of time. I mean, no joke. There's probably, I would say three to four hours just in pre-cleaning. I had each movement, you know, each little part in a little jar with a brush and some solution, either some naphtha or, um, you know, uh, Zippo lighting fluid, lighter fluid, you know, something that won't hurt shellac. And I was, you know, with a small uh, brush and I was cleaning each part that way and peg wood and scrubbing it and 
fiberglass brushes to, to remove uh, rust. I mean, it was a whole process. So, uh, I mean, this video would have been tw easily twice as long as I, if I kept all that in there, but I've, I, I kind of figured that most people would rather prefer seeing how this watch goes back together than uh, all that amount of time showing cleaning because I mean, there was just way too much of it to even to make a montage out of it. So, uh, but yeah, it, 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 this one took quite a bit, but uh, I really think all that effort was worth it because uh, this is all the same parts that came off of it. So I'm, I'm really, really pleased about that. So we're getting the keyless works put in here and you've seen before the winding pinions and the sliding clutch and the sitting lever go in and then the alarm sitting lever. And I'm just applying some grease to a few points on here where the yoke and the setting lever spring and a few of the different parts are going to interact with one another that I can tell. And then as later on, when we get more things put together, I'll kind of work that system around a little bit and see if I missed a spot or two here or there. And I did on one, I, I'll even show it on here too. And I'll go back in and, uh, you know, there's one spot here or there where needed some lubrication. So I add that in, but, um, right now the yoke just went in. And this is the setting lever spring for the alarm pusher. So we get that put in and I put a little dab of grease at the tip of that, where that spring presses down on the alarm setting lever. So uh, there's a lot of wear. you can see a lot of wear marks on that part. And um, there's definitely a lot of pressure. So I put some of the thicker grease there. This here's the yoke spring, pretty strong spring. And I kind of pre-lubricated on the main plate and on the yoke where that spring is going to Sit actually just on the main plate. I'll lubricate the yoke part here in a minute, but get that spring put in and use my hold down tool. And then here, I'm just applying a little bit of lubrication where it interacts with the yoke. But then when I raise my tool up, I notice it spring kind of wanted to pop up with it. So, you know, I just kept it all in one shot and sped it up here a little bit, but that's, uh, you know, I'm being very careful this second time just to make sure that spring stays in place. Now lubricating this post, that's where the other side of that setting lever spring, the second spring on that is going to go. So we'll go ahead and get that put down into place. Now I'm going to go ahead and get a couple of these screws started, but not tighten down fully, but just in. And then once they're in, then I'll go ahead and set tension on those two springs and go ahead and lubricate the other steps of that as well. I lubricated the post as well, but I just don't want those to be dry. It's always... It's always been my opinion. And again, I am, I am not an expert or someone who should be stating fa any sort of fact on watchmaking because way more people who are, you know, more qualified than I am, but just in my limited experience, I find I like to have more lubrication than not enough when I've on that part, because you can know, you can very easily go back in after it's in and then clean it up. But right here on that first, you know, pulling out of that crown and all that. I, I want there to be lubrication there and it not to be dry because I've, I've had it, those pieces dry before and only the post lubricated and it was really, really difficult. So, but you could see, you could feel an immediate difference when you do it that way. Then I just go in later and clean it up. So no harm, no foul. And, um, you know, it, it feels a lot better. Now we're just applying some more lubrication on the stem for the alarm and getting that put in. And as I'm pushing that in, I'm kind of looking at the interaction of all those parts. And I noticed here that alarm setting wheel actually goes past it, past that one little ridge on that setting lever spring to the other side of it. And I hadn't lubricated that before. So I took care of that. And now I'm just going to clean up the excess. And everything's looking pretty good. So now we can install our cannon pinion. So a little bit of grease here to the outside of that. That is the shaft for that center wheel, that first wheel that we put in the watch. That's it on the other side of the watch. And now we can press on our cannon pinion. That one felt pretty good. Wasn't too loose. Wasn't too tight. Now we can begin putting some lubrication down for on a few posts here for the, the setting wheel rocker for the intermediate minute recording wheel. That was for the intermediate unlocking wheel. And here's that sleeve I was talking about before. And, uh, going to, Go ahead and get that in and it didn't want to, I kind of had it in at an angle here, so I didn't want to push in. So I pick it up here and kind of get a better view of it, you know, off camera and then go ahead and pop that into place. So that can go in. There we go. Apparently not. 
There we go. <laughs> yeah, that's the joys of doing this voice work afterwards and me trying to make thorough videos. Uh, you know, I got to fill the gap with something sometimes. So there's Seiko's, according to the manual, they call that the minute recording minute wheel, but that's really an intermediate wheel for it. And I'm applying some lubrication to the underside of this, that permanently affixed wheel on the setting rocking lever. And we'll go ahead and get that dropped into place. There we go. And then there's a reverse threaded screw as identified by the three slots on it. So we can go ahead and get that tightened down as well. Next up is the disconnector spring. So this spring puts upward pressure on that disconnector lever and which the disconnector lever is going to sit on top of it. And so it's always pressing upwards on it. And when that spring engages and that disconnector lever goes, you know, engages it, 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 it the force of the, you know, the, all the parts in the movement to kind of overcome the force of that spring it moves out of the way and then allows that hammer, which we're installing now to run. So we lubricate, speaking of the hammer, we lubricated the bottom pivot of that. And then this is the alarm wheel and those little star looking teeth on there are what interact with the hammer. So that wheel, the, the pinion on that connects to that rocking wheel that we installed on the um, part of the alarm train bridge on the other, other side of the movement. And then the manual kind of gives a few little lubrication points here that we need to make sure we hit. And then um, the manual says, you know, that it just has a, well, there, I'm, I'm thinking, cause that's where the hammer kind of stops and hits against that recess on the main plate. And so I'm using some thicker grease there because I'm thinking that's a, you know, that's a pretty high friction point. And then the back side of that wheel where I just put that dab of grease is where it's going to interact with that alarm bolt yoke, which that's where it rotates off of is, that post there. So we put a little bit of lubrication in there and there's the alarm bolt yoke. So we're going to put that on and then make sure it's on the outside at the bottom of your screen of that hammer, just like that. And these are the contact points on that alarm bolt yoke. And then the, the head of that screw is actually the other side where that alarm bolt yoke spring attaches to. So here I'm going to, we're going to go ahead and install this before that screw goes over it. So, we're going to get that around the screw head and then on the part itself. And that's really like, especially with Seiko's, I can't remember the last time one of the, you know, the, the, the tension surfaces, the surfaces that a spring mounts up against was a screw head. Um, I can't remember seeing that before on anything I've worked on. Maybe it's more common than I think it is, but I mean, it's definitely convenient. So, you know, they've done that. It seems to work fine, but it definitely is a, it's not a very tall surface to, for that spring to rest up against. So I'm constantly at this point concerned that that thing was going to pop off. So a little bit of lubrication here for the minute wheel. Go ahead and get that pressed down and put into place. I sure hope you're enjoying these closer up views. Um, again, I really played with the, you know, the, the camera settings and then the, you know, the lighting, I, I didn't change any lighting, but I just kind of changed how I had them set up kind of around the watch. Cause I, my main goal was to get like the, the brightness levels between like the, both of the main cameras, camera one and camera two to be really close to one another. Cause I'd seen on some previous videos where they weren't, especially like if I had my hand over the movement, I'm screwing something in Well, I'm blocking a lot of light with my hand, but I still wanted it to be visible where we could zoom in and kind of show you something a little bit better than what you'd seen previously on, on my channel. So hopefully, um, hopefully this works out well as I'm viewing this video, doing the, the, uh, voiceover work, it's not in high def. So it, everything looks fuzzy <laughs> and then I re-render it out to HD. So, you know, as I'm looking at it, it doesn't look good, but generally, you know, when it renders back out of the video, it looks pretty good. So I'm hoping this thing turns out really well. So getting this, uh, date setting spring put in. There's a lot of tension on that spring, a lot of tension. Uh, and I mean, I was really surprised at how strong that thing was, but we get that put into place and clean up the excess grease. And I was making sure we don't forget our little washer here. 
that's for the setting wheel rocker, which we're going to install next. We put some lubrication on that post. And I'll tell you what, there's one there and there's one of those also on the date driving wheel for the calendar works. And I'll tell you, I mean, uh, finding those in the bottom of a parts basket after you clean is not the easiest thing in the world to do. <laughs> it, uh, it took a bit. I knew they went into the wash. So, I mean, they had to come out, but, uh, they were there. They're just not easy to see. Uh, cause they blend in with that, you know, that mesh basket pretty, pretty easily. But now, uh, using the lessons that we had learned from disassembly, I'm going to go ahead and install this screw now, rather than waiting for that calendar plate to be put on. So there we go. And now we can go ahead and lubricate a few more spots here. That's for the intermediate alarm setting wheel. And then these are posts for part of the calendar works. Go ahead and it's almost out of oil on my oiler there. So I'm just kind of making sure that I got that in there. That tiny little wheel is called the intermediate date driving wheel. And then this wheel is called the intermediate date wheel. Uh, same name, but without the word driver, I almost think like Seiko is just, you know, <laughs> I don't know. They, they didn't really put too much thought into the part names, I guess. Uh, they just called, could have called it intermediate wheel one and wheel two, but, uh, that's what they call it. So now we can go ahead and put the disconnector lever in. So it sits underneath a little lip right there and then sits on top of that disconnector spring. We need to put a little bit of lubrication in there where those meet. There we go. Now we can put on the calendar plate and you can see that intermediate alarm setting wheel, that, uh, pinion that's on top of that. That's going to interact with, there's an, uh, an intermediate wheel on the underside of the cover plate that we'll install later that is going to interact between that and the unlocking wheel. And so next up after we get this plate screwed down is really the moment I've been waiting on since I got this watch. And that's now it's time to test the alarm. So what I'm going to do here is just put a little bit of wind in it, leave the, put the sound on and just take a listen. And I also want to check the function of the disconnector here. So we'll see if this works. Oh, that's too cool. I gotta do it one more time. Also put an arrow on the disconnector here so you can see it. Check this out. That makes me happy. <laughs> uh, it's working. Uh, just. Uh, good feeling. That was probably more satisfying than seeing the balance come up because that one was a new one for me. So now we can put our repaired day and date driving wheel in. We'll get that put into place. Uh, put a little bit of lubrication on that beforehand. And now make sure that this fingers in on the, the correct orientation, which it is. Uh, I, I kind of caught that. Well, that part could go on one of a few different ways, a few different orientations, and it would affect, you know, how, how quickly the, the day would roll over would happen along with the dates. So I, I referred back to the manual to make sure I had it in the correct, correct orientation and then get our washer on. And uh, we can get, this is also a reverse threaded screw. If memory serves, I think there's four of them in this watch. So we get that put in. Now we can go ahead and apply some lubrication to our cannon pinion and put on our hour wheel. And those three little notches you see there are, you know, protrusions that kind of point upward. And those will interact with the unlocking wheel that's gonna be put on afterwards. And the way this works is there's kind of holes in that unlocking wheel that I'm putting in now. And thankfully when I put it in, they kind of all lined up right. And I'll put some lubrication in each of those. But what happens is, is when it, if you have your alarm engaged and turned on, what's going to happen is 
as that rotates around, those holes are going to line up and it's going to allow the alarm disconnecting lever spring to raise up those, thus disengaging the disconnector and allowing the hammer to go. So those are all put in place. We got that spring put in and now we can go ahead and put on the day wheel or the date wheel rather, excuse me. It didn't really look like it was set in there good. So I'm just kind of fiddling with it here for a second and that looks okay. There we go. And I'm applying a little bit of lubrication to the quick set right there. And a little bit more lubrication on the post where that date jumper is going to go. So we get that slid in around that post and the other side kind of in between two teeth. And now our little spring that should be in the, you know, aerospace, you know, the space program, because those things love to fly, but we'll very carefully go ahead and get this spring put in. And I had my hands completely in the way of the other camera. So this is the view that we get, but uh, I think you kind of get the idea. I'm very carefully making sure that springs sit in fully. Now we can get our cover plate put on. So I'm being very careful here to make sure that that wheel that's on the underside of that plate is engaged with both that unlocking wheel and the intermediate calendar setting wheel. And that's the wheel that you see, you know, on that previous shot there that was kind of, the teeth were kind of poking out the side of the movement. That's that one. And it's what this also has is that star gear to turn the day wheel and then the day setting wheel, which I'm, lubricating the point on the day wheel where it's going to interact with the, with the, the wheel itself and uh, where that sitting lever is going to interact with the wheel. And then on the back side of that, that post where the spring sits a little bit of lubrication on those two. And I'm just going to clean up a little bit of that. I made a little bit of a mess there. Now we can put on our day wheel. So we'll rotate that around, rotate that around where the big holes visible. And then I'm just going to use the pointed end of my hold down tool to set that setting lever in place. And now just kind of give it a test. We pulled the crown all the way out and we're rotating it around in the day and date rotate over like it should. And now I want to check the alarm. So we'll pull the alarm pusher out to engage it. Then I'll rotate the hands around to see if the alarm engages. That seems to work real well. You can see as I, the alarm started to go, I, advance the time further and the alarm stopped. So that was a good test. So we put our little dial washer on and now we can fit this dial back into place. This thing's starting to look pretty darn good. I'm really happy with the way this is turning out, except for that screw. Um, I'm gonna go, I, I actually sourced another one. I'm gonna replace that screw. It, uh, it didn't clean up all that great, but uh, I, I don't want that corrosion to move elsewhere, you know, as time progresses. So we check the quick set and these are the hands and, you know, after closer inspection, this is under the microscope, you know, I'm just, I'm not happy with it. Uh, I was going to try to kind of save these, but I decided not to. So here I'm setting the uh, time to midnight right here. There we go. And then we'll go ahead and get these hands put in. There we go. There's the hour hand. We'll do the same thing for the minute hand and for the seconds hand. And one thing of note is in order to, there's, there's a few different ways to, that I've read on how to, you know, set the alarm, you know, and get it configured correctly. So what I did here, uh, I've seen a few different videos of people doing it. What I did is once I got the hands all set in place, I moved the hands to midnight and then I put the crown in the second position. And then I wrote the alarm setting around until the instant the alarm rang. And so that should mean that the alarm is configured to midnight now. So I used those settings to place that alarm set, uh, setting wheel around. And now we can go ahead and get these, these replacement clamps. I, I got in and you can see that finger there that's on that at the top of that, that rides in that little ridge on that ring where the old ones didn't weren't there. And these were pain to, to get in, to get that, that, that part on there and then get the screw in while holding that thing up and in camera, it was a nightmare. <laughs> so 
I wanted to show you these are the these two pieces are the old clips and where those fingers are broken off and you can clearly see on that one that's installed on the watch where that finger is in and kind of how it holds that wheel down so so it can rotate around so there we go and you know as i mentioned earlier about not keeping this video too terribly long just showing the cleaning process the case was really not much better um i didn't go crazy with it but this case was severely scratched and beat up, but I didn't want it to look brand new. Um, and then, you know, me not having lapping machine, you know, rounding corners or anything. So very carefully, very slowly, I, um, tried to take as much out of it as I could, but there's still a few tiny marks in there, but we have a replacement crystal here and there's a tiny little hair on the underside of that crystal. I do see it. And eventually I do catch it later on. Um, before this watch is done, I do remove it, but it does sit there for a while. And it drove me nuts as I was editing this video. Cause I remembered cleaning it off and I couldn't remember when I did it. And so it, it hangs around for a while, but we got the bezel on and now we got the crystal on. It's got a new tension ring and there it is. And you can see that, that little hair at the nine o'clock position towards the center of the crystal driving me nuts. I uh, did some brushing on the top of it. And then, uh, some, uh, polish on the sides, trying to be very careful not to round corners. And, uh, I think it turned out really well. And, you know, under a macro lens, this view here is under a 50 millimeter macro lens. The other one's under 105 millimeter macro lens. You're going to see everything, right? So, you know, it doesn't look perfect when you, when you have it on your wrist, you're looking at it normally, it looks fantastic. So I'm really happy with it. So now we need to install the parts for the automatic works and the manual says to be very liberal with lubrication here. So we put a, a good amount of lubrication on that post and we can get our yoke put down, set into place. And now we can get our transmission wheel in and kind of had a bit of a time here to kind of get that in place and get those yoke put, you know, the, the, uh, not the yoke, but the Paul levers around it. But there we go. That gets down there. And then the, Paul ever popped up. So we'll push that back down. There we go. Now I can put on a cover plate and this cover plate here has two screws on it. So I kind of just work those down a little bit at a time and, uh, get those all tightened down. And I gotta say that little tool, I mean, that little Horatech hold down tool. I wasn't sure if I'd really like it because, you know, I mean, those are expensive. I've never bought one. It's expensive for what it is, but, um, you know, I'd never considered buying one, but I really like it. So a little bit of lubrication here on the bottom pivot of that. And now we can go ahead and put this in the watch and I do a pretty awful job of doing it and getting it lined up. But eventually I do. And kind of, once you get it set into place, I'll, uh, I'll, you'll, I'll, I'll turn the ratchet wheel screw and put a wind in it that way to make sure that all the gears, here we go. Make sure that everything's kind of interacting with one another. And then you saw that plate kind of sit down. But under this view, you can really see the pitting on that case. It, uh, you know, it, it's clean now. And so, you know, there's no more rust, no more dirt, no more rust, nothing like that. It's not going to degrade any further. And it is working, but, uh, that sure did take a toll on it, but applying some lubrication here to the pivot on the transmission wheel. And then a little bit on the sides of that, where it's going to work around with the yoke. And then here for the uh, oscillating weight bearing and that bearing sure did clean up pretty nice. Made a little bit of a mess there, but we'll go ahead and get that cleaned up. There we go. Now, before I put in the spring or the oscillating weight and everything else, and then the retaining spring, I want to go ahead and get the, both of the, uh, the, cr the crown and the alarm stem in. Both of these got cleaned up and then brand new gaskets as well. The recesses in that case, I really tried to, to clean up and I did as good a job as I can, but there's some discoloration still on those crown tubes, but um, it's pretty good. Rotating of that bearing around that transmission wheel rotated correctly. And uh, regardless of which direction we rotated the, the oscillating weight bearing. So that's good. Now we can go ahead and get this weight put on. And these kind of holes are indexed and they only kind of, you know, the, the, they won't fit in until they're in the right orientation. It took me a minute to kind of get this one where it belongs, but getting this, we get this tightened down. There we go. Now I can give this a test just to make sure that 
I'm going to rotate this around in a few, you know, both directions a few times. And I'm one, I'm listening to it. I'm going to feel like the, you know, the play, if there's much play on this bearing and everything's feeling pretty good, it's not rubbing anything. And so this thing's coming along super nice. Now we have this case, this retaining spring and there's a cutout in the, in the case where that kind of lip feeds in and Seiko had to put it right next to the balance wheel where you got to put it in and be super close to the, they should have put that. They could have put that anywhere else on the case and you wouldn't have had any issues, you know, but no, they got to put it right there. We got to get right next to that balance. I don't know. Maybe they're hoping that you'd bump into slip and hit it. And then you'd have to go buy a balance from them. I don't know, but it sure seems like it was a, you could have put that anywhere else on the case and it would have worked fine, but whatever we got it. Now we put some silicone grease on this rear gasket. So we got a nice fresh new gasket, make sure it's all flat and nice. And now we can put this in. And also what I did here is I wanted to put some circular brushing on the case back and not having a lapping machine. Normally that's what you would use to do it properly, but uh, those are super expensive, for, especially for hobbyists like me. So I kind of developed my own little holder to hold those case backs center while they rotate. And I applied my own circular brushing. I think it actually turned out pretty well. I was really surprised with it. So um, I can do circular brushing, I guess. So that's awesome. But now we can go ahead and get the case back properly torqued down. This watch is really starting to come together. I'm just using plastic to make sure I don't scratch anything. Now we can go ahead and get our strap installed. This one is a custom made leather strap. I had made for this watch. It's an XL length so that I can actually wear this thing. But with that installed, now we can function test this one more time. So we'll, with the crown pulled out to the first position, we'll set the alarm to as close to five o'clock as we can get it and pull the alarm button to enable it. And then I'll just go ahead and pull the crown all the way out and set the time to five o'clock and see what this thing sounds like. That sounded great, and we went ahead and stopped the alarm by advancing the time forward. You can also, normally under normal operation, you would just press the alarm button or just allow the spring to, to unwind fully and the alarm will stop on its own. But that is the finished watch. I am super happy with how it turned out, especially considering it was my first ever mechanical alarm movement I ever worked on. And I got to say, it's a lot less intimidating now that I've actually done one. I was... I really studied and did my homework on this one before I started and while going through it as well, referring back to the doc, any documentation I could get my hands on. But again, I, it, it, these are less complicated once you actually get your hands on them. And I'm really pleased with how this thing turned out. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the video. I sure hope you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed making it again. If you like the channel, if you want to hit like, and subscribe, leave a comment. If you'd like, I try to respond to as many of them as I can. Thank you all so much again, and we will see you on the next one. Take care.